The first reading for today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, People of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Holy words, holy wisdom. Today's Gospel is taken from portions of chapter 15 and 16 in the Gospel of John. And today I'm using the translation from the Inclusive Bible, and I think this translation helps us to hear the story in a, in a different way. When the Paraclete comes, the Spirit of Truth who comes from Abba God, whom I myself will send from my Abba, she will bear witness on my behalf. You too must bear witness, for you have been with me from the beginning. I didn't tell you this at first because I was with you. Now I am going to the one who sent me. Yet not one of you asked, where are you going? You're sad of heart because I tell you this. Still, I must tell you the truth. It is much better for you that I go. If I fail to go, the paraclete will never come to you, whereas if I go, I will send her to you. When she comes, she will prove the world wrong about sin, about justice, and about judgment. About sin, in that they refuse to believe in me. About justice, because I go to Abba God and you will see me no more. About judgment, for the ruler of this world has been condemned. I have much more to tell you, but you can't bear to hear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, she will guide you into all truth. She won't speak on her own initiative. Rather, she'll speak only what she hears, and she'll announce to you things that are yet to come. In doing this, the spirit will give glory to me, for she will take what is mine and reveal it to you. Everything that Abba, God, has belongs to me. 
This is why I said that the Spirit will take what is mine and reveal it to you. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is a major celebration in the church year. It's Pentecost Sunday, that day when we celebrate how God lives and moves and has being among us. Now, first of all, I must say this. Whoever put this Bible together and named each of the books has it wrong. The title of the book of Acts, I think, is very misleading. We often call it the Acts of the Apostles. But it really should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. That's what this book is about. That's who this book is about. Oh, sure, the apostles do plenty of action in this book, but most of their action is reaction. The real action in the story, the real direction in the story, is from the Holy Spirit. Open up the Acts of the Apostles, of the Spirit, and check it out. All throughout the seven weeks of the Easter season, whether in years A, B, or C, we read from the book of Acts. And what we see when we read these texts is that every major move that the church or the leaders of the church make in the book of Acts is initiated and prodded by the Holy Spirit. Here in today's reading, we find the disciples gathered in the upper room, waiting, waiting, for what they do not know, for they're practically as good as dead. The great, glorious, heady days following Jesus' resurrection seem so distant. Jesus had left them once again, and they are all alone. Oh, sure, Jesus promised that he'd send them something, something the scriptures call the counselor or the advocate. But really, what did that mean? And so they stayed there in Jerusalem, all huddled up together. How could that small group of lifeless and dispirited disciples do anything? How could they achieve anything? Their motley crew had little hope and even less confidence. But like that valley of the dry bones that we read about in the book of Ezekiel, we witness how the wind breath spirit of God began to blow. In and through them, God's spirit moved. They say it looked like flames. And that image evokes all the other biblical images of how the presence of God is described in the language of flame and fire. We think of the time Moses encountered God in the burning bush. We're reminded of the story in Exodus where God led the people in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Perhaps we recall the story of the transfiguration where Jesus' appearance is changed and his face shone. The image of flames is not the most important thing here, however. It might be cool from a cinematic point of view, but what makes this account even more dramatic, even more unbelievable, is that here the Spirit is given to them all. To them all. Previously, the Spirit was a possession for a special purpose. We think of the judges or the prophets throughout Scripture. God calls, the Spirit is given, an individual accomplishes the task. But here at Pentecost, God changes the way God operates. A new thing is being done among us. God's Spirit shall be with and abide with us all the time. My goodness, do you understand what is being said and done? God's Spirit resting on each of us to bear God's creative and redeeming word to all the world? God's Spirit resting on each of us to be God's agents in this world, to be a vehicle of love and compassion, to be a prophetic voice in the midst of our communities, no longer the purview of one person here and there, no longer the task given simply to one here and one there, but to us all. My goodness, what is this Spirit up to? 
Is there no end to the breadth and depth of the Spirit's workings? It starts here in this story in the book of Acts and continues on. Time and again we read of how the Spirit propels the church onward into new ventures, into new ways of experiencing the love of Christ, into new and sometimes difficult understandings of what it means to be the people of God. All throughout this book of Acts, we see the Spirit at work. Gathered in Jerusalem that day were Jewish people from every nation on earth, it says. They were there for a big celebration. And that long listing of the nations in our reading from Acts is meant to convey that every nation on earth had somebody there at Pentecost. There were strange nations with strange-sounding, difficult-to-pronounce names like Cappadocians, Medes, Elamites, and Mesopotamians. But as one scholar has pointed out, this Pentecost gathering is not only a diverse ethnic gathering, it is also a historically impossible one as well. Those Medes who were there at Pentecost, he says, would have had a tough time getting to Jerusalem from Mesopotamia, not only because they had to travel a few hundred kilometers, but because they had to travel a couple of hundred years as well. And the Medes have been long gone from the face of the earth for at least two centuries. Those Elamites, they're mentioned back in the book of Ezra, and not again. They are also lost in the past. We have here, not only a gathering of people from the north and south, east and west, but also from the living and the dead. It's fascinating. As I travel throughout the churches of the ELCIC and other denominations, I notice a particular architectural feature in some of our very oldest congregations. Perhaps you also are familiar with this. The front of the church is very typical of a lot of these older churches, where there is a communion rail in the shape of a half circle that wraps around the altar. An architect friend once told me that the shape and design was very intentional theologically and symbolically. The design arose from the time when most churches had a cemetery as part of the church property. And as you gathered for communion, you came and knelt around the altar in this half-circle arrangement. And the symbolism was that the rest of the circle extended out beyond the walls into the rest of the church property where the church cemetery was. In other words, when you came to the altar for Holy Communion, you were being reminded that you gathered not just with the people who were sitting in the pew next to you, but you also gathered with all the saints, with the communion of saints of every time and every place. You gathered not only with Grandma and Grandpa and Great Uncle Frederick and Aunt Martha, you also gathered with those mentioned here in Acts chapter 2, Elamites, Cappadocians, and Mesopotamians. This strange, playful story is Acts' way of saying that when God's Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, it was poured out not just for a few, but for all. The Holy Spirit is God's way of being portable, of not being restricted to time and place. It's often said that the word God is not a noun, but a verb. It's a word of action. The same is true of this aspect of God, the Holy Spirit. It's a verb, an action, alive, engaged. This is an act of God, seeking, searching, leading, guiding, comforting, renewing, saving, loving, calling. The Spirit is given to call us forward, to call us into action and service, to be agents of change and seekers of justice, engaged in neighbor love and grounded in service. One of the terms used in Scripture for the Holy Spirit is that of counselor. And this name of counselor isn't so much about making us feel better as it is a counselor who helps you work through things, make changes in your life, your attitudes, and your actions. Another translation of the biblical term for Holy Spirit is that of advocate. We think of someone who walks beside us and advocates on our behalf, 
But this is done not so you can be a passive participant, rather an advocate helps you achieve change, transformation, and justice. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Abide in us. Restore us. Transform us. Reorient us. Propel us forward into love, service, justice, seeking, and justice making. Love for the world of God's holy creation. Love for each other and love for the neighbor. Maybe that half circle of a communion railing isn't just about being reminded of the saints who have gone before us. Maybe that half circle extends out beyond the cemetery, into the world beyond, into God's beloved creation, among all people, neighbors, and strangers, beloved. Amen.